Hi, this is the third Jamboard session on TDA and statistics. We're going to be talking about landscape means once again, doing a little bit more of the math. In the previous two sessions, we highlighted a gap in the theory of persistent homology, the lack of a mean, a well-defined mean of diagrams, and the proposed solution, uh, persistence landscapes, that was developed by Peter Bubenik. The last Jamboard session finished with examples from Bubenik's paper. He will develop the math, as I said, just a second ago. Okay, first, let's review the process of constructing persistence landscapes. We start with a persistence diagram of PD. So we know it's a collection of points BI, DI, satisfying DI greater than or equal to BI greater than or equal to zero. We want to transform them to the MH plane with BD going to one half B plus D and then D minus B over two. So the effect of the transformation is to map the wedge in the BD plane where the persistence points lie. So that's D greater than or equal to B greater than or equal to zero. Maps it to the first quadrant in the MH plane, but to the other wedge. We'll see this in a second. So for each point BI, DI, we use the same formula and we produce points MI, HI. So what does this do? It maps the positive D axis, so that's the vertical axis, to the diagonal. So 0D goes to 1 half D, 1 half D. That's the diagonal in the MH plane. And it takes the diagonal in the BD plane, D equals B, to, it takes it to B comma 0, so it takes us to M axis. Once we had the transformation and we have our persistence points and our transform persistence points, we defined peak functions, fi from, for each mi hi. And here's the picture from our last Jamboard session. So we had three persistence points on the left, 2, 4, 3, 9, and 7, 10. They get mapped to points in the mh plane, 3, 1, 6, 3, and 8, and a half, 1 half. We see on the right, and we see the three peak functions defined by those points. The peak functions have a definition. It's simple to define because they're zero, increasing with slope one, decreasing with slope negative one, and zero, we have the formula here on the right. So fi of m, at zero if we're less than or equal to bi, m minus b, so it's a function of m, so we see that has slope one. For b, for bi less than or equal to m, less than or equal to bi, one half bi plus di. And when we're on the right-hand side of the peak, it's going to be d minus m. So it has slope negative 1. It's a function of m. And this is for 1 half b0 plus d0, bi plus di, less than or equal to m, less than or equal to di. And for m greater than or equal to di, we get 0. Now, we use these peak functions fi to define landscape functions lambda i. So for each value m, we're going to be looking at the values of the f1m up to fkm. The first landscape function, lambda 1, is going to be the maximum of the values. The second landscape function, lambda 2, lambda 2 of m, is the second largest value of f1m up to fkm. And the jth one is the jth largest value of f1m up to fkm. And so for lambda j, j bigger than k, we get zero, identically zero. OK, so what does this do? From the definition, we can see because we're picking largest value, second largest value, and so on, we get a decreasing sequence of functions, lambda 1 greater than or equal to lambda 2, greater than or equal to lambda 3. And lambda j is identically zero for j greater than the number of persistence points. We want to consider this as a collection, and we'll be using all the functions in the collection to compare persistence diagrams. We'll write lambda p, p is for the persistence diagram, equals lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. However, we'll have multiple persistence diagrams, so multiple landscapes, we'll want to compare them, so we'll write lambda pj, and if we want to distinguish between the landscape functions, we'll use an upper uh, index j, superscript.
proceed, we want to introduce the concept of a norm. The norm in a vector space is based on the idea of length in Euclidean space, Rn. So we're familiar with that if we have a vector x, x1 up to xn. We define the length of x to be the sum of the squares of the entries of the x of x and take the square root. Okay. For multivariable calculus and linear algebra, maybe one, maybe both, we know that this length function satisfies three properties. Of course, it's always greater than or equal to zero. And it equals zero if and only if x is the zero vector. This property is called positive definite. Second property, the familiar triangle inequality, the norm or length of x plus y is less than or equal to the norm or length of x plus the norm or length of y. That's the triangle inequality. And the last property, if we take c, multiply it by x, where c is a scalar, c pulls out, but it pulls out as absolute value. That's because underneath the radical, we're going to have a c squared. When it pulls out, we get absolute value. This is called absolutely homogeneous. The function is homogeneous if when we multiply the input by a constant c, that pulls outside to the value. But here, because we pull out the absolute value, it's called absolutely homogeneous. OK, so this will be our motivation. So if we have a function, which we'll also write with double bars, on a vector space v to the real numbers. We'll say it's a norm if it satisfies properties 1 through 3 on the previous page. So I won't repeat them here. An important example for what we're going to do is with continuous functions. So if we have some interval in the real numbers, a, b, and look at continuous functions on that interval, what we'd like to do is define a norm on it. And it's a very simple definition. It just uses the integral. So the norm of a function f is the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f of x dx. We see right away that it's greater than or equal to 0. We can also show it satisfies all the properties, properties 1, 2, and 3. But it's important to note that it matters that these are continuous functions, because in calculus we know that we can integrate a continuous function on a closed interval and get a value. Okay? So the proposition is this function defined this way is a norm on the continuous functions on AB. And then it will be a norm as the first of the homework problems for Friday. Okay, let's do a simple example. Let's let F be a peak function. And suppose the peak uh, is for the point M0, H0. And suppose we have a long interval of A, to B, A equals zero to B. So we can think of B as the largest value we would be getting for any of the persistence points persistence intervals. So if we integrate this function f, absolute value, on the interval a, b, well, it's only non-zero where the peak is, where it's shaded. So that's from m0 minus h to m0 plus h. If we integrate there, it's the integral of the absolute value. But of course, this is a right triangle. So we don't have to do any integration. We can just compute the area, the base times the height. So in this case, you see the base is 2h0 because it extends from m0 minus h0 to m0 plus h0 and the height is just h0. So 1 half 2h0 times h0 we work it out and we get uh, 1 quarter h0 squared but h0 is d0 minus b0 squared. So we can relate the area here back to the persistence diagram. Now, we're interested in landscapes, not peak functions, so it's not enough just to define the norm on peak functions. We have to do it for, or functions, we have to do it on landscapes. Remember, landscapes are a collection of functions, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. Of course, each lambda i is continuous, so we're going to define the norm of a persistence landscape lambda to be the sum, j equals 1 to infinity, of lambda i, the norm of lambda i where it was defined on the previous page by an integral. You notice we have the sum to infinity. Any one of these sums will be finite, but we go to infinity because we don't know whether a persistence diagram will have 20 points or 1,000 points. But they will, functions will be zero after some finite value. Okay, so uh, this is the definition. And if we have b as a large value, we can do the integrals over all the same intervals, zero to b.
So since the landscape function lambda i is greater than or equal to zero, the norm of lambda i is just the area under the graph of lambda i. So let's see what happens. Suppose lambda is the landscape function of two persistence points. Let's do an example. Lambda will be constructed from the two triangles. Simple geometric argument, which will be an exercise, shows that regardless of the values of the bi di, so that means whether the triangles overlap or not, or one is inside the other, the value of the norm will always be one quarter d1 minus b1 squared plus one quarter d2 minus b2 squared. Okay, in fact, this example generalizes. If lambda is constructed from peak functions, b1 for the points b1, d1 up to bk, dk, then we can say that the norm of lambda is the sum i equals one to k of one quarter di minus bi squared. So the norm can be calculated from the peak functions. We don't have to use the landscape functions. So here's an outline of the proof. If we're given a landscape constructed from peak functions, for each point mh in the first quadrant, we can assign uh, a value. It's the number of peak functions fi where h is less than or equal to fi of m. Okay, so let's see. Here's an example. So on the top, we see the peak functions. We see, we see one, two, three, four different peak functions in this picture. Two are the big ones, two are the smaller ones. Now for each point in the first quadrant in the MH plane, we can consider the number of triangles that contain that point. So we see above the peak functions, there, there are no triangles there. For all those points, MH, the value is zero. On the other hand, if we're below the largest peaks, you see in red the number one, that says in those regions, but above the smaller peaks, the value is one, it means there's one peak that's above that point. So for instance, if we have a point here on the right, there's one peak above it. We have a point here, there are two peaks above it. And inside the small region here in the middle, there are three peaks above it. So this allows us to assign values in fact, we can think of this function capital F as a function on the whole plane, whole uh, first quadrant of the plane anyway. Now, if we go take this diagram and go down to the second graph, here we see the landscape functions, lambda one in red, lambda two in blue, and lambda, it should be a lambda three down at the bottom, uh, defined for those four peak functions. Okay. So the total area under the graphs of the lambda i on the bottom, so that's the sum of the areas under the lambda i, can be computed from the top figure. Areas labeled one count once, since they lie below a single peak. Areas labeled two count twice, since they lie below two peaks, and so on. In general, a region labeled j in the top figure is contained in j triangles defined by peak functions. So this area lies under the graph of lambda j, but not lambda j plus one, and will be counted in the integrals for lambda one up to lambda j, but not for lambda j plus one. This result directly relates persistence diagrams and persistent landscape norms. So now let's go back to this idea of a vector space. We're just calculating this for particular functions, so now let's let L be the vector space spanned by the set of persistence landscapes. So every element is a sum of landscapes, a finite sum of landscapes. So notice that we have the sum of persistent landscapes. It's not necessarily a landscape of a persistence diagram. So now let's take lambda, uh, an element of capital L, then L equals lambda one, lambda two, lambda K, and so on. This sequence is eventually zero because L is a finite sum of landscapes, persistence diagrams, all of which are zero after a finite number of terms. So the proposition is if we define norm of lambda to be the sum I equals one to K of the lambda I, this defines a norm on L, okay? And that's proof of this will be an exercise. Now let's return to the means of landscapes. 
Suppose we have diagrams PJ, our persistent diagrams, each corresponds to a barcode. Let's call a barcode BJ, point BIDI, so a persistence point in the diagram PJ corresponds to a bar that extends from BI to DI in BJ. This will be useful in, in interpreting means. Okay, so let lambda PJ be the persistence landscape of PJ. So the means of the lambda the mean of the lambda pj's, well, that's going to be a persistence landscape function with a sequence of persistent landscape functions, lambda 1 bar, lambda k bar. Each of these is the mean of the corresponding landscapes functions uh, for uh, j. Okay, so we have lambda i, take all the lambda functions lambda i, we add them up, so lambda i j, we add them, divide by n. So the mean of the ith landscape function of each of the lambda pj's. The question is, how do we interpret this mean? What are the values of it? So here's a statement from Bubinick, which we won't prove here, uh, but we'll have some examples of it in the homework. Here's Bubinick's interpretation. If b1 to bn are barcodes, they have a corresponding persistence landscapes lambda 1 up to lambda n, then for each i, the mean function the mean function of these landscapes is the average value of the largest radius interval centered at M that is contained in I intervals in the barcode. So the intuitive idea is if we see a barcode and we take any, any value between B and D in the barcode and we look at all the barcode intervals that contain that, then there will be a largest symmetric interval about the point which fits in all of those barcodes. So we'll see some of this in the homework. So that's the end of this Jamboard session.